This episode is proudly supported by Pepe Sayer Australian Cultured Butter, batch churned from single origin cream. We've got a culturing process, a fermenting process, an aging process. So the butter will taste very different than, I guess, the average supermarket butter. Uh, I like to say we make butter makers butter. Like this is the sort of butter butter makers will would like to eat simply because of the slow process in which we ferment and age and, and get the flavour into it. You know, the natural fermentation that gets all the flavours into the cream and then once you churn it, you end up with this really rich, flavoursome butter that evolves and changes because it's a live culture that's in the butter as well. For more information, go to pepisaya.com.au. You know, we wanted to concentrate all our energies into just cooking really delicious, simple food and serving it and cleaning up and going home. That's all we wanted to do. Simple hospitality. You know, it's nothing complicated. It's like, yep, we feed you and you go. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. The importance of the local reliable restaurant or cafe has never been more evident than the last few years. A place to rely on, to make connections, to feel comfortably sated and remember the importance of community and nourishing delicious food too. But what does it take to create these hubs of the community? Glenda Lau is the co-owner of Bayswater Kitchenette. Glenda, how are you? I'm good, thank you. And you? I'm good. It's good to have you on the show. You've um, had a pretty amazing career uh, abroad and in Australia, and you find yourself with a little a local uh, restaurant. Um, what's it? What's it like running a little place after working in such big establishments? Oh, I I compare it to um, it's like leaving the corporate world and moving down the south coast. Uh, <laughs> that's what it feels like, you know, because we've created something that's so tiny. It's across the road from where I live. And that's basically what it is. I wake up in the morning, I wander across the road, I do some prep, you know, and then we open for a few hours at night and I've got a pretty easy life. I'm, I'm logged off by 11 o'clock, so it's pretty easy, you know. Yeah, it's, no, it's really nice. It's an 18-seater. It's tiny. Yeah. How, how did it come about? Oh, my girlfriend, Alessia, I met her. She was managing a cafe um, literally just outside my house. And so I would have coffee with her every day. And that's how we got to know each other. And then because I walk up the driveway, I can see this shop that's right on the corner all the time. And it's had various businesses there um, over the years. Um, And, you know, the Felice sign would come up quite a bit. And then it was the Felice sign was there for quite, like, almost two years when um, when a Japanese business moved in. And then I found out the guys who owned the pizza shop previous to that had bought the building and, and they decided not to do the pizza shop anymore. They had other businesses they wanted to concentrate on. But because it had been empty for so long, they asked a, fr- a, a guy, a chef that they knew, which is a Japanese chef, whether or not he wanted to do it. So they... They fitted out the restaurant for him, put him in there, and he only lasted six months. So the day that he moved out, as a joke, I said to Alessia, you know, oh, did you know the Japanese chef has moved out? And she turned around and said, do you want to go and have a look? Because she's a trained chef. Um, you know, she's she's from Italy and she's got two degrees. She's got a pastry degree. She's got, you know, she does the savoury side of things. And I didn't realise she wanted to do it so much. So she said, let's go and have a look. And I said, well, just by chance, I know the landlord. So we called him and he said, yeah, come and have a look. So we came and she said, oh, I really want to do this. Let's, you know, let's sit down and have a discussion. So we sat down and we sort of had the same idea. So she said, come on, come on, come on. They basically convinced me to do it. <laughs> and that was that was literally a period of six to eight weeks that we decided all of this. Yeah. Well, tell us about what, you, what you're doing there. You mentioned it's such a tiny little venue. What, what, are, you, what are you doing? Well, I say it's like a nighttime cafe. You know, we've got regulars that literally just drop by. We know the community um, and we just do really simple food. The idea was that because I've lived across the road for almost 20 years and they're all in this area, they're all one bedroom studios. And so a lot of people live on their own. And the thing that my neighbours always used to say to me is, I can't believe you cook, you know, and I say, well, I eat in restaurants five nights a week. You know, the last thing I want to do on my weekends, I just want a home-cooked meal. I want something just, you know, simple. 
And then one of my neighbours said to me, you know, well, I just go across the road and I get a pizza two nights a week, you know. And it's like, well, you can't, it's not nourishing. It's not. So we, what we wanted to do was provide something that was, you know, simple enough for people, especially people who live on their own. You know, you could never. And so what we do are these dinner boxes. That was the main idea. Um, that we had and that we built the business around it is that providing a complete nutritious meal for one person. And so we set the dinner boxes at $15 and we cook them in a batch. We put them in containers and then you can just pick them up. But what we really wanted to do was feed the community and all these people that are alone. So that's basically the concept behind it. So when we saw the restaurant, when we saw the shop, it had this beautiful um, counter which, which you could fit six people on. And we thought that's perfect because you can come on your own and you don't feel alone. You can sit there, we're keeping you company or you can read a book, but we've kept the prices below $30 for that reason as well is so you can afford to eat it. Yeah, but really simple ingredients, you know, and that's the way she cooks. That's the way, and that's what I said to Alessia, you know, Italian food is that. It's all about the fresh produce, um, you know, simple ingredients and things that people love to eat. You look after the front of house part of things. What, how do you how do you create a wine list for for that sort of offering? Oh well, we um, Alessia had a friend who basically works for a wine company, and we said, well, this is this is what we want to do. It's just really simple. We just wanted a light, medium, full bodied white, red, and rosé. Everything's by the glass. You know, you know when you go to places and you don't. You don't need to know what side of the mountain the grapes were grown on or what year it was, this and that. It just needs to be delicious and it just needs to suit a purpose. And that's basically what we wanted. You know, you don't need to know the name of it. You can just say, oh, it's a Sangiovese. And people go, yeah, I'll have that. You know, that type of stuff. That's the type of list that we created. You know, something simple just to provide. But we also we also allow the option for BYO for that reason is because in this area, a lot of people collect wine. You know, and I don't provide orange wine. I don't have Rieslings. I don't have Sauvignon Blanc. So, you know, you're quite welcome to bring it because we don't have the room to store it either. So we have one beer, one cider, you know, three reds, three whites, one rosé and a sparkling. That's it because we just don't have the room for anything more. This business started before the pandemic. Did the model you create make it easier to navigate through this period of time? Well, that's where we were really fortunate is because we only targeted the local market. When we had this discussion when we first opened, um, you know, we had I, – I already had all these ideas. You know, we're not going to have a phone. We're not going to uh, – you know, well – the idea was that 2011, the postcode, has twenty to 30,000 people living in this area. And so I said to Alessia, you know, this is basically what we can target. If, we, if, if 2011 can't sustain our business, then we're doing something very, very wrong. And so that's basically what we did. We just concentrated on the blocks, like, like a radius, maybe a kilometre radius, you know, and that was basically it. You know, and just by chance, we built it on that. But it's the dinner boxes that saved us because that's how we started building up a local market is that people caught on to that. The people, the single diners caught on to it. Uh, all the people living on their own caught on to that. And then we were providing, we provide meals like literally for people who don't cook either. So there's people who buy boxes from us every day and that's, and they were, they're our regulars. And so when it came to the lockdown, we were only eight months old when that happened and it was really scary. I mean, no one knew what was happening. It was, um, it was really, you know, it was really stressful in the sense that the rules had changed. And in all my years of experience, nothing that I knew could have been applied to it. And that's what was really stressful. But what, what, we, what we discovered was that all these people who live alone, we were the only people they saw that day. So we would see the full spectrum of fear. You know, there were people who just took it really lightly and then there were people that literally turned up in full PPE. They were covered in bin bags, gloves, the lot. Yeah, it was really full on. When I think about it, just watching all that was just, yeah. With this focus on the local community, do you have any stories of um, regulars that you've connected with and the impact that you guys have had on them? Well, last night we said goodbye to a family that we've known since the beginning. So when they first started coming, their little girl was was only probably about 15 months, 18 months old, and she's just turned four. And the mother's just um, the mother got um, promoted and took a job in New York. So last night we said goodbye to them, 
and they came, you know, because they're like family. You know, we've watched the little one grow up. And I just remember her face, like the first time. So the parents are American, and um, but they've lived here for 16 years or so, the mothers, and they met here. And so um, Bubble was born here. But I just remember the first time, the very first time um, they decided to order the banoffee pie. So we have banoffee pie as a dessert on the menu. And the, and the parents were like, well, we've never had it before. And they ordered it. And I just remember looking over at the table at that particular time when they gave Madeline a spoonful of it. And the way her eyes lit up was like, what did you just feed me? You know, like it was literally a revelation. And I thought, oh, my God, you know, it was the cutest thing ever. And then last night we said goodbye to them because they're leaving either today or tomorrow morning. And um, and it was just so sweet. She's four years old. She comes in and, I, and we also started sitting them at the counter. I noticed that when we used to sit her at a table, after, after maybe about 10, 15 minutes, you know, they'd have to give her the phone to distract her and this and that. And then we got an idea and we'd sit her at the counter. And that's when she started paying attention, you know, didn't, and she really started engaging, watching everything and then participating. Whereas previous to that, she was always quite shy, would come in. You know, now she, she just walks in. I said to her the other day, I said, well, you know, you've got to go grab your cushion because, you know, she needs the height. So she goes, she gets her own cushion, puts it on the chair, climbs up on the chair and just sits there and waits for dinner. And she's the sweetest little thing. The sweetest little thing. But, you know, there's, there's so many of these people. that, And that's the reason why I, I always attribute that to the reason why we survived COVID, the lockdowns, is because we've got such amazing support from the local community. We had one couple who live up on Springfield Avenue and they said to me, when the first lockdown came, they came around to the shop and they said to me, you know, oh, we've got a spreadsheet um, we've put down all the restaurants that we want to survive and we want you to make it through this. And so we've put you down as a Wednesday night. You're our Wednesday night. And so we're going to come and buy something from you every Wednesday just to make and get you through this. And and that's what a lot of people said during our first lockdown. It was so touching. Yeah, it really was. And so by the time the second lockdown happened, we had the benefit of being open for two years. Um, and so we'd already built, you know, a bigger client base. Um, we had more support. And, and because we already had the model, we already learnt from the first model that the dinner boxes were what we were going to sell and that was going to be our primary income. So, you know, we averaged, um, we started selling maybe 15 boxes a day when we first opened, 10 to 15 boxes a day, um, come lockdown, the first lockdown, we upped it to about 30. And by the time we hit the second lockdown, we were upping them to about 50. Wow. And we were making two to separate dinners a day just to give them variety. So people would buy one for dinner and then one for lunch the next day because they were staying at home. Mm. Mm. Take us back to when you were young. What, what sort of role did food play in your family? Oh, it was massive. I come from a family of, um, I like to call them accidental restaurateurs. You know, my grandfather migrated here. Uh, my grandparents migrated here. They left China in the 50s and they migrated here and they did other things. And then my grandfather bought a restaurant, decided he was going into the restaurant business. He, he opened one of the earliest um, Chinese restaurants in Nashville. Um, so we, we were actually there the other night. We were actually there having dinner the other night. I took one of my best friends and I said to him, are you sure you've never been here? And he said, no. And I said, well, it just so happens, you know, when we were kids, because I went to school in Asheville as well, every time we walked past this shop, you know, they would always point out this used to be your grandfather's restaurant. And it just so happens um, the building is still, um, still houses a restaurant and the building is still in my family. Um, my uncle owns it now. Um, and it's where Eton is. I don't know if you've ever been there. Uh, oh, because, um, yeah, well, Eton, Eton became um, well-known because the chef and the manager from Golden Century left and they opened it. So it's quite popular with a hospitality crowd. It's like, getting, it's like getting Golden Century food but half the price in the suburbs. It literally is so good. Um, yeah, so, and then because of that, my mother, would, my mother used to finish school and was forced to go to work then. So she just went, I don't want to work in restaurants. I want to go to school. But she was forced to work there. And it just so happened as well that my father first met my mother then because he came looking for a job. And that's what we discussed on Sunday night. 
And he, and just as I mentioned it, my mom said, yeah, it was back, back there downstairs behind. <laughs> that's why. But nothing happened. I mean, she was too young at the time, but that's when they first met. They, they met again at uni. But food was really important. Like it was always about food in my family. You know, being Chinese, it's always about food. But I think um, the greatest, I think, I think the important lessons were learnt from my grandfather. He had, my grandmother was the primary cook. But when special occasions came, my grandfather would really lay it on, you know, the big steamed fishes, the, you know, the braised pork dishes. He would cure, um, he would cure like lap chug and things like that. And he would make salted fish. He, he grew vegetables in the backyard. Like I don't like snow peas because, I mean, I eat them, but I don't like them because, you know, he would come snow pea season. That's what you'd have for dinner every night. And he'd always say to you, do you know how expensive these are at the shops? And that's the reason why you had to eat them, you know, things like that. But the important lesson I learned from him was that because we always used to go, oh, but rice is so plain. Why can't we put soy sauce on them? And he'd said, no, it's because you're Chinese. We don't eat rice with soy sauce. And then he'd and then he said, um, you know, Cantonese food is really pure. It's about tasting the ingredients. We don't we don't mask it with anything. And and that's the lesson I learned about food you know I remember tasting my first oyster when I was four my father gave me my first oyster and then apparently every weekend after that I was asking for them when are we going to have oysters again you know but everything was centered around food because my mother has a really large extended family every weekend was a gathering you know before we had to go to Chinese school we'd be going to yum cha my grandfather was the um grandmaster of the Chinese Masonic Society. So he was always in Chinatown and my grandmother would say, come on, we're going to Chinatown, we're picking up your grandfather. And then you'd have a meal out there or, you know, all the all the uncles would be giving you snacks, just feeding you. I was a really fat kid because they were always feeding you. <laughs> Tell us about the early days in the hospitality sector. What, what were the real key moments that made you decide that that's where you'd have a career? Well, that was, it was because... um. I actually, I fudged my birth certificate when I was 13 because all my friends were going to get jobs in the summer at McDonald's and I was still too young because I was the youngest person in my year. So because my dad had a home office, I basically fudged my birth certificate, photocopied it so I could get a job. I think you had to be 13 years and seven months and I think I was only like 13 years and four months or something. So, and the McDonald's was only maybe about four blocks away from the house and um, I got a job there. And my mum said, yeah, yeah, that's a good, that's a good idea because what I like about McDonald's is they teach you how to clean, um, you know, so you'll learn important lessons there. So she said, she gave the tick of approval. She's really naive. She didn't really understand that I was too young. She just got away. Yeah, yeah, you're good. Good on you. You're going to get a job for the summer. Keep you busy. Keep you out of trouble. But what started happening was that um, they rostered me on a breakfast shift and and I think I had to start like at five o'clock in the morning. And and my dad said, No, you're not walking up there, you're too young. But it was only four blocks away. And and so and then he was really shitty. He didn't want it. He didn't want to have to get up and drive me on a Sunday morning. And so and then one one morning I set my alarm and I just walked up there and he was so upset. He just said, No, you're not doing this. So he he drove up there and had a chat with my manager and said, You're not to roster her on she's 13 you don't roster her on a breakfast shift and I'm not driving her he was literally four blocks away so anyway they said well what if we and I but I really wanted to make some money so they said well, what if um you get a job we've got friends that own a cafe on George Street in the city they said how about we get you a job with um Uncle Albert and Auntie May and I went really and they went yeah and so that was Westside Cafe back then so that was in between the cinemas oh my god it was so exotic but so they would let me catch a train on my own out into the city to work for these friends and then they would drive me home. So that was the premise. They would drive me home, but we didn't finish till midnight. So they would let a 13-year-old go to work and I was, and then Auntie May said, oh, I'll give you, how much are you getting paid at McDonald's? I'll give you 50 cents extra. And that was my pay, you know. And I was like, yeah, this is great. So that was where I learned, you know, that was my first experience with an espresso machine. Um, I learned how to carry um, three things. I learned how to carry three plates, you know, and it was fun. 
you spent a bit of time in uh, the nation's capital uh, doing a degree, but you also worked in some restaurants during that time. What sort of impact did that have on you? Uh, that was huge. So when I, I, I didn't want to work in restaurants. My mother actually said, um, oh, it'd be good if you can get a job in a restaurant because at least I know you're being fed. Uh, and so that's what happened. My brother got a job in a restaurant and he had absolutely no experience at all. Uh, but our flatmate at the time was working at um, a place called China Tea Club and said, oh, okay, we need a runner. And then they liked the fact that my brother was always smiling. And so when my brother mentioned to them that I actually had some experience from a cafe, they said, well, why don't you get her to come and work? And I said, oh, I don't want to work. Um, I don't want to, I don't want to work in a restaurant. They said, well, you just do the desk, you'll do reception, you'll answer the phones and whatever. So all right, I can do that. And then eventually they pushed me out onto the floor. And then it was like, I got the hang of it because it was my, it was actually, it was my second licensed premises I'd ever worked in, but I never carried a tray. And it was really formal. Like the waiters were dressed better than the, the um, customers most days. Um, because the owners, and this is where the owner was just, um, the owner of China Tea Club was a group of um, guys from Hong Kong, um, Josiah Lee, who still owns Chairman and Yip, and he's part of the chairman group. So he was, and the day that I started here, he just turned 30. And he's, yeah, and I was so impressed. I was so impressed that this guy had this fancy restaurant. He'd already opened another restaurant previous to that, which is where they made all their money. And what Joe used to say to me was, I didn't even complete my degree. I've, I've, still, got, I've still got one subject to go, and he didn't even bother completing it. I think Danny Yip was the only one that completed it. Oh, no, and there was another partner called Steve, and they were the only two that completed their degrees. But Joe would always say to me, oh, no, this is much more fun, you know, and I would say to him, but I don't get it. You come from a really fancy international city like Hong Kong. Why are you in Canberra? And he said to me, because there's a, there's a market here that that can be exploited. That's his actual words where they, you know, like a big fish in a small pond. That he, but, you know, they did really well out of it. And he taught me so much. So when they opened Madam Yip, um, which was in Dixon, that was where I wanted to work because it was like a cafe, but it was really fun. It was like a Shanghai style cafe. It was a mix between, um, and that's where I really got the taste of it, was working for them there. And then I was part of the opening team when they opened the first chairman in Yip on Bunda Street. That was super exciting because that was another premise that that was a restaurant that had been there for 40 years. And, you know, we watched it getting demolished. We watched it getting built and then we were a part of opening it. And Danny said to me, and I, I just happened to, um, I failed my third year of uni. And Danny was the one that said to me, you know, come on, give yourself a break. Why don't you come and work full time for a bit? And he's the one that convinced me to go, you know, my parents weren't happy about that. They said, no, because if you do this, you're never going back. But Daddy was like, come on, you just need a break. And I thought, you know, yeah, you're right. And that's when it started. That's when the that's when the feeling started, like, I can actually do this. You know, I'm really good at this. I'm loving it. I'm having a really good time. I'm making really good money. I'm going to give this a go. And that's basically, yeah, that's what ignited it is that experience, that one year that I took off. You ended up working in London and in some incredible restaurants, both there and in Sydney as well. What, what's been the real sort of key uh, venues and moments for you? Well, for me, um, having worked at places like Asia to Cuba and Hakkasan, I think for me, I was lucky enough to be part of these restaurants when the founders were still involved you know, at the base levels when they weren't, when they weren't franchises, like Hakkasan, Alan Yao would be in the restaurant all the time. Do you know what I mean? This is before it became another one in, you know, London, Dubai, wherever they all are now, you know, when he was still really involved and this was his prize, you know, um, Asia to Cuba was the same because it was so, you know, being a part of a team because um, St. Martin's Lane Hotel, which is where Asia to Cuba was housed, um, at that time was owned by Ian Schrager, the guy from Studio 54, you know, and so to be able to interact with these type of legends, it really cemented, you know, it's like, and this is pre-internet too. This is pre-internet when you could research everything. This was just word of mouth. 
people go, oh, you should come and work here, come and work here. You know, you could learn this, you could do that. And that's how I, that's how my whole career has sort of been defined. It's like, where can I learn and what can I get out of this? You know, and it was all by word of mouth. And it's just by chance when I arrived in London, um, my flatmate had gone out for a drink and then bumped into someone and then said, oh, I'm working here. And then they said, oh, Glenda needs a job. And I ended up there. And then I found out that my friend Rupert was the manager there, you know, things like that. And I'd worked with him in Canberra. You know, it was like all connections like that. And that's the other thing. I realised how small the hospitality world is. The industry is around the world. And that's what made it even more exciting is that you could drop into any country and then as soon as someone said, oh, this is where you work, do you know this person? It's like, yeah. And then you become instant friends. It's like this instant connection, you know, this camaraderie around the world that you feel, you know, that you could travel the world and work and make money and have fun. And that's basically what it was. Just did that the whole time. I think I think that's the reason why I stayed being a waiter. It's because you can just drop in and drop out and do whatever you want, whenever you want. When you came back uh, from London, you worked in some incredible restaurants. Were, were the restaurants different to your experiences in London? Yeah. I mean, I worked at Key before I went to London and that was um, – in the early years, and I just remember the day that I was leaving, they had said to me, oh, there's a new chef starting tomorrow, and that was Peter Gilwall. But I, I couldn't stand the chef before him. Like, literally, that's why I quit and decided to go. You know, he was like a French chef. He just used to scream all the time. And he was the chef that was in between Guillaume and Peter Gilmore. And, um, you know, it had gone down from a three hat to one hat, so he had all these issues and he was just taking it all out on the staff, you know. But London was so exciting. Um, it was, yeah, it, I'd never experienced because that was the, when I was there, it was the era of the large restaurants, you know, the really super big ones like Terence Conran and things like that. You couldn't get a decent meal unless you paid £100 for it. Um, and, and they, and they were really late nights too. Kitchens were open till 12.30. So I was doing four sittings. Like when I was working at Hakkasan, I, I was opening at six and the last orders were at 12.30. I was literally doing four sittings in my section. But the, the main difference was the pay. You know, I remember when I started at Asia to Cuba and I did my trial and the girl said to me, have you even been a waiter before? And I thought to myself, why would I come to, a restaurant of this caliber and not have experience. And that's when I realized, you know, that people in the UK, they don't, well, in London specifically, they don't necessarily have experience. It just fits into their lifestyle. It fits into the fact that they want, you know, whatever residency, they this, that, that, that. And so in that sense that I thought that, um, yeah, I don't know, that it wasn't a serious it was just play. People just did it because that's all they knew how to do. Whereas I thought in Australia it was a little bit more serious. They paid you properly because we weren't getting paid properly over there either. The tips weren't good. The service charge went into a trunk. Like it was very complicated. But I didn't feel secure basically. It didn't financially I didn't feel secure. Um, I only came back because I was waiting for um, – I was waiting to see if I could get a visa uh, and waiting to see if someone could sponsor me. And then they said, one company I worked for said yes, and so, but I had to come back for them to process it. And then I waited and I waited and I waited and it didn't eventuate. And so I was stuck here. And so in the end, I decided to stay. Uh, but I had, I was literally waiting. I, I just packed up a suitcase and I thought, oh, I'll just spend summer at home while I'm waiting for this to be processed. Um. And then, I, and then I couldn't get in touch with anyone. I couldn't find out what happened. And by the time I finally got in touch with someone, they said, oh, we didn't think you were coming back. And I said, are you kidding me? I've got, my, I've got rent I've been paying over there. I've got all my belongings over there. And then you've just decided not to process it and without telling me. And so I was stuck here. And so then I had to start rebuilding my life here. But it was so – and I, I'd actually gone back to Key because I still had friends working there. And I said, yeah, yeah, come back. Um. And it was so easy. I found it so easy because, you know, I remember Peter Gilmore going at 9.30, okay, kitchen's closed. And I'm like, what? It's 9.30. <laughs> I'm like, I haven't done anything, you know. So the pace, the pace was different, you know, and then I started enjoying it. <laughs> so. 
one of the establishments you've worked at before, Bayswater Kitchenette, was uh, Automata, part of the new wave of dining in Australia. What, what was it like being part of that? Well, that was exciting. So I met Clayton at Key in 2000 and I think 2005. I think he was part of the team then. Um, and it was the same thing. I, you know, people, uh, friends of mine had said, oh, you know, Clayton's opening a place. And he'd approached me and asked me whether or not I'd be interested in being um, the manager. And I said, no, it's not my thing. Um, I, I'm just, I'm just don't have the energy for it. Um, but he really wanted me to do it. And even Tanya, his partner, said to him, you know, I don't think you tried hard enough. You should have gotten her. And I was like, no. You know, I was I was working, I think I was working at Honeycomb at the time when Andy Bunn was there, I think. I'm not sure. Um, and, you know, it, and that was where I got the taste of local, you know, that it was just around the corner from the house. It, you, um, you know, we, it was a really lovely community that sat around in the restaurant. And I said no. And so anyway, I finished at Honeycomb and went back to Maryvale. Um, they asked me to come and open, set up uh, the rooftop at Coogee Pavilion. And um, and then after I did that, they moved me to the Beresford and I wasn't interested. And then someone kept saying, you know, well, Clayton's still opening. Um, and then a project that I was working on for them, they decided not to go ahead with. And I didn't know what to do. So I rang Clayton. I said, are you still looking? And he said, yeah. And I said, I just want to be a waiter, okay? And he said, yeah, come. And and that was literally two weeks before they opened. And it was just so exciting to be a part of it, to be able to help my friend, you know, open his restaurant and just to be part of, yeah, this new way of dining, Um, you know, especially working with people like um, Timbo and Abby, you know, they'd all worked in places. And I – I was so out of touch with all this, um, all the natural wine movements and things like that. I had no idea. I looked at the wine list. The first day I sat down to training, I went, I don't know a single wine on this list. I don't know what I'm doing. And I felt, I actually felt with all my experience, I actually felt like um, really isolated. I had no idea. No, yeah, it just, it was a really bizarre experience, but I was surrounded by people with all this energy and that's what made it exciting. Yeah, and his food's amazing. You know, I love the idea that he wanted something casual, but because he only knew how to cook fine dining food, that that's what it was. You know, kept the price at $88. It's going to be fast-paced. It's going to be loud. I went, yeah, I can do this. You know, and it was a really great team. Like there's lots of young people that were running circles around me, and I thought, oh, I love this. I love being taken care of by all these young people. Because there's all these stairs and I'm like, I can't do these stairs anymore. I've got knee issues. I've got (laughs) – no, but it was good fun. It was really good fun. It was actually heartbreaking for me to actually have to stop Clayton and say, you know what, I'm going to go. I'm going to leave you to it. But I'd already said to Clayton because I could feel myself towards the end of it, I could feel myself getting – I wasn't coping with the pace. I wasn't coping with, you know, like because the 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 menu started getting a little bit um, uh, more intricate. People's dietaries started, you know, get, people's diets started getting more complicated because we realised, you know, what as as much as we wanted it to stay casual, it wasn't it wasn't going to be the case because, you know, all the requests were like, oh, it's my birthday, it's a special occasion. So that's when we realised, you know what, we've got to change the direction of this place. We've got to start treating it like a special occasion place because that's what people are expecting from it. Um, and I just, yeah, when you looked at the when you looked at the, um, uh, the sheet in the kitchen with all the dietary requirements, oh, I don't eat duck hearts, I won't eat this, I won't eat that, and it just started getting really complicated. And I just thought, you know what, it's getting too much for me. Absorbing all of this is getting too much. And I actually pulled Clay. And he used to joke and call us because there was quite a few of us that were mature waiters. You know, like if you put four of us in a room, we would have over, we would have had over 100 years of experience on one floor, you know, that type of thing. And he used to joke and call us the dinosaurs. And I pulled him aside one day and I said to him, look, you know, I, as much as I love you and I want to be here, um, I'm going to leave it up to you to say to me, you know what, Glenda? You know, I, like I said to him, I don't want to be that cranky waiter. I don't want to be that, that waiter that all the young ones turn around and go, I don't want to work with her. 
She's always cranky. She's always this. And I said, I'm going to leave it up to you to kind of pull me aside and say, you know what? It's time. <laughs> it's time. <laughs> but he, he never did. And so the day that I had to do it, I had to say to him, you know, I'm going to leave you to it. I'm, oh, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to go. And um, I've decided I'm going to open my own business with a friend and have an easy life. Are you going to be okay? And we kind of just stood there. We're looking at each other with tears in our eyes. And I, I, he goes, I understand. And I said, I know, but you've got a really good team around you. You don't need me here anymore. You know, I, I'm lucky to have been a part of it. Oh, look at me. I'm getting emotional. <laughs> Well, you created your own venue after that and made incredible connections with the local community. What, what, what sort of impact has that had on you? Oh, it's amazing because I've lived in this community for so long. Oh, sorry, Huck. <laughs> That's okay. Take your time. Uh, um, yeah, no, this is a really, I said, you know, I love this community. I love this block. I love living here. I love, you know, I love... I just love the people. There's a, that's just a mix of all these people that live here. You know, you've got students, you've got people with heaps of money. Yeah, it's just a really vibrant community here in 2011. You know, Potts Point, Rush Cutters Bay, Elizabeth Bay. It's just, you know, and it's been really special. We call it a nighttime cafe. You know, I don't serve coffee. I don't even have a coffee machine. People go, can I get a skin cappuccino? And go, no, why not? You know, they expect me to be a restaurant, but I'm not. You know, we're a kitchen. I just want to remind them that. I go, if I could tick a kitchen box on all the forms that I've I've filled out, I would have ticked that, you know, but you can't expect all these things from me because that's what we're not. You know, we set these rules. People go, I can't believe when all the other restaurateurs in the area, start, you know, came to check us out because we're really lucky. You know, Lee Tran Lam, you know, wrote us up and this and that and Joanna Savile did a write-up in Qantas magazine. So everyone was coming going, all these other restaurateurs are like, what's going on here? How did you get all this publicity? Are you paying for PR? I'm like, no, you know, we're just really lucky, you know, that we found a niche in the market and we just catered for them. Oh, what do you mean? You're not open Friday lunch. You're not open Saturday night. It's like, no, because there's two of us. We literally, there's two of us. We cook, clean, serve. That's why I don't have a phone because I don't have time to be answering a phone. I've got eight tables. What to be able to hear the phone ringing all the time just to go, I'm sorry, I'm fully booked. Oh, no, I don't have a table. No, I'm not open Saturday. I can't do that. You know, we wanted to concentrate all our energies into just cooking really delicious, simple food and serving it and cleaning up and going home. That's all we wanted to do. So to get people in this area that understand it, you know, and, and that are okay with it because I find people who are agitated that we don't have a phone, they're not the type of people we need or, you know, or the people, people that are going to come. But the people who have sought us out, you know, or walked past and said, oh, I'd really like to just have a meal, yeah, come on in, sit down. You know, it's really simple. It's just simple hospitality. You know, it's nothing complicated. It's like, yep, we feed you and you go. You know, it's done. That, that's the purpose of it. We just wanted you to have a nutritious, delicious meal and we're done now. So, you know, and people get that and that's what's really lovely about it. You know, and people walk past with their dogs. Everyone's always saying hello. Everyone's always waving. You know, you go shopping and you see people. There's people that follow me in Harris Farm Markets to see what I'm, what produce I'm picking. <laughs> <laughs> and they'll say to me, you know, because I shop there every day for the shop. I go there and I look at the vegetables and I pick what we need every day. So when people see me there, it's like, oh, what are you buying today? Oh, how do I pick this tomato? What type of mango are you picking? You know, it's that type of thing. It's like, yeah, so it's really lovely to be a part of this community. Yeah. You didn't expect a career in hospitality and you had your arm twisted to open your own venue. What is it that you love about what you do? Because <laughs> I find it really easy. I'm like that lazy waiter. <laughs> you know, I don't have to put too much effort into it. And I get paid and I get to live and I get to do the things that I want to do. You know, it's pretty simple. That's pretty much it. There's not much to it. Okay. <laughs> and I've had a lot of fun over the years doing it. It's not, you know, I've had the opportunity to travel. I've had the opportunity to meet amazing people, work with amazing people, learn so much. Um, yeah, that's pretty much the basis of it. There's not much to it. Well, Glenda, your influence on so many uh, diners in Sydney uh, is incredible and um, we're very honoured to have you on Deep in the Weeds today to hear your story. Please keep in touch and uh, we'll catch up again soon. 
Oh, thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. <laughs> I can't believe it, though. Like, seriously, who wants to talk to a waiter? No one ever wants to talk to a waiter. <laughs> but, but thank you. No, really, thank you, Huck. <laughs> this is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we take a deep dive into the lives of the incredible people who ply their trade in the food and hospitality sector. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds Podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well.